So first things first, who we are. I'm Nancy Bonk, and I am the owner of a leadership training company called SWIM. And three years ago, until three years ago, I was the CCO of Ogilvy Toronto. <coughs> Uh, I'm Elaine Davis, and I am a life and career coach, ETD coaching. Um, I work with mostly creative professionals, uh, people in the advertising world, but also I work with novelists and filmmakers and stylists and photographers, so really just trying to help them strategically think about their next step. And hi, I'm Laurel, uh, Laurel Stark. I am a freelance ACD. Uh, spent most of my time agency side, currently working with the br uh, Google Brand Studio. Um, and I also teach digital advertising at the Academy of Art University. So we're here for the soft skills, the soft skills of leadership, as you've, as you've heard. Um, so nobody hands you the manual, right? Nobody, it's like. <laughs> you will. <laughs> there you go. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna give you a few pages out of it. Uh, so I, I couldn't fail to notice that when I got my promotions to, with more and more leadership responsibility. It's like, it, yeah, and how, how do I do that? Uh, once upon a time, there was a lot more on the job learning. Today, not so much, <coughs> right? There's, it's kind of sink or swim. And that's where the name of my company, Swim, comes from. Is that's the current model, is hope you figure it out. Sink or swim. Um, but the fact is, is that if you're going to be effective stepping into roles with more of this kind of leadership responsibility, you really do need to um, gain somehow these, these soft skills of leadership and embrace them. And it involves fundamentally having some new behaviors um, that can actually be, in many cases, quite counterintuitive when you think about it relative to where you were before you became the leader. Um, it's critical to successfully make the shift from me to we, as I think about it. Are, how many of you are feeling like that's kind of where you are at the kind of the beginning of that transition? So quite a few, or are other people already like you've been a leader for quite a long time? So several of you also, and I think, you know, I work with people right up to people who own their own <coughs> companies that are CCOs that are still really struggling. One guy approached, approached us at SWIM and said, 10 years in, as a very successful CCO, he said, I don't know what I'm doing. I do not know how to successfully, I realize I don't really successfully know how to successfully lead people. And I know when I first got that job, I felt like I could not lead a cop to a donut. <laughs> so, so I had quite the learning curve, and, and maybe, maybe a lot of you do too. Today we're going to talk about um, three shifts in mindsets and behaviors that would, would um, benefit any of us as we're, as we're trying to have a bigger and bigger ripple effect and have more and more impact on the groups around us. Um, and they are shifting from being a poor listener to a good listener, um, shifting from a lone wolf style of management to a collaborative one, and from finally me, me, me to mentor. So that brings us to the uh, first mind shift, um, all about becoming a good listener. Gee, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> I, when I first um, left, well, when I left the CCO job at Ogilvy Toronto um, and started forming the curriculum for this leadership training company, I was fortunate enough to meet a woman named Claire Hasid, who was the head of planning at Saatchi for s quite some time. And she said, I hope you are going to include listening skills in your curriculum. And I'm like, What's that? <laughs> it had not really crossed my mind, even after a very full career in advertising, to even think of listening as something that I needed to work on or that should be top of mind for me. And now I really wish I'd had what I'm going to share with you today on my side when I was in that role. Um, poor, it, it, here, here's what I learned from her. Um, Poor listening skills, which I think I'm going to convince you we all have, um, can have a huge impact on our outcomes um, and, a huge, and become a huge barrier to our success. They're the difference between <coughs> potentially selling the work you want to sell or not 
It can be the difference between keeping a really valued employee or losing them. And the list goes on. So before I go any further, I want to ask, who here considers themselves to be a good listener? So a lot of people. And, and I have to admit, I never thought I was. So I was at least I had that consciousness to know I wasn't. But I want to go on and ask one more question, which is, how many of you have ever been, let's put yourself in this situation that you're hearing client feedback. How many of you have been hearing what they're saying and simultaneously thinking about what you're going to say in response? I want to see 100% of hands going up now. <laughs> right? So we've, we've all done it. And I have the news flash for you um, from brain scientists. You literally cannot do both at once. You literally cannot hear what someone is saying in real time and be thinking about something else, let alone formulating a complicated, you know, pushback to what they're saying. So that alone, I've got, I, I'm afraid I have to let you know you're, you're busted on, on listening. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally busted on that. I, I'm, I do that all the time. Um, but what does that actually, how does that actually affect you? Uh, well, we're paying the price, like we're paying quite a significant price for doing this. And, and I'm going to boil that right down to two major ones. One is we're not getting all the information. So if you really think about that, it makes sense, right, intuitively. If I'm not hearing everything, I'm not getting all the information. Think that through to its logical conclusion. I might be going forward and doing stuff based on just partial input. Have you ever left a meeting where everybody thought something else happened? Yeah. Yes, right. So that's, that's classic. Because we literally, we <laughs> all only heard certain amounts of what was said. So that can be a, a giant problem when you turn up with work that does not reflect what was actually said to you. Makes sense, right? The other really big problem is that poor listening skills hurt relationships. How do you feel personally when you haven't been heard? You know, if you, if you just ponder that for a moment. Yeah. Any thoughts on what it feels like to not be heard? I feel like the other person might have Asperger's. <laughs> Sometimes that has happened, actually. Like the smarter people or smarter clients that have like really, really high IQs, like they literally can't stop. They can't pause in the conversation. They're very, like, tunnel vision. They've actually developed some different communication skills with the people of more Sheldon's, if you will. Right. <laughs> from okay. the bank. Um, but I find like the, the one thing listening wise that distracts me is not thinking what I'm going to say next. It's the subtext and micro expressions of the other person. Because I find that people rarely say to me what they're actually wanting or thinking. And I don't have a reason for that yet. Well, I, I will say that for, for me, when I feel that I'm not being listened to, I feel offended. Mm -hmm. I feel I'm not respected. I feel like that's just a giant negative so when you think about the, the client in front of you and you've just demonstrated you're not really listening because you just said something immediately back to them that doesn't necessarily <laughs> reflect what they were exactly saying the cost for that is higher than you might guess um, I've spent a lot of time talking to clients since starting swim and hearing more about where does the agency go wrong and that's kind of at the top of, the, near the top of the list, if not the top of the list, for so many people. W feeling, especially when it's a creative presentation, th that sense that the agency has walked in and they've already got their story straight and whatever the client's going to say, they're going to stick to their story and they're going to, you know, they're going to not have a lot of nuance to how the, how the response is to what's being put, you know, said to them. So that is a client who is not really open to buying what you're selling if they feel they're not heard. So this is just plain old psychology, really, and common sense. But we don't really, I think, I certainly didn't spend any time really pondering this. In fact, I prided myself on, I can't wait to say my comeback to what they just said because they're so wrong. So that just doesn't, that just doesn't feel great, you know, when you're, when you're projecting that. So hopefully you're not as bad as I have, have been in that situation. Um, the employee that doesn't feel heard, that is another big problem. How many of you have 
people that report to you one way or another. So almost all of you, right? Wow. Near the top of the list why people will leave your job is they don't feel heard. So I'm going to point out to you, I hope, some, some ways of being much more mindful about making sure that you are not only truly listening, but making sure people feel that you want to hear from them. Yeah, it's, uh, you've given some great examples. I know that I'm pretty much guilty of all of those. So um, what kind of a bad listener would you categorize yourself as? I am, and you realize that I've never heard these questions before. <laughs> this is totally spontaneous, spontaneous and just off the top of our heads. Uh, Claire told me, Claire Hasid told me there are several kinds of bad listeners. So there's selective listening, which I bet you all know immediately, like this is kind of no, no explanation required, right? Like when I was in focus groups, I was so selectively listening. I, was, I would literally write down what I wanted to hear. It's like, awesome. I heard three people say really good things, and the other 20, I don't really, I don't even remember what they said. Um, so we've all been there, I think. There's initial listening, which um, I like to uh, think of Jerry Seinfeld's funny quote when he said, you know, the opposite of talking is waiting. <laughs> so that initial listening is, you might have started out, I'm okay, I'm, I'm hanging in with you, but very, very soon into this, you know, we're going we're gonna to want to have the pause so we can jump in. And I know I am, I, again, I'm giving my, you're getting to know me very quickly because uh, I know I'm painting a certain picture. I can't wait to tell you about how much I relate to what you're saying and what it was like when I went through it. Um, there's false listening, which is just plain old pretending to listen. And I've been in an awful lot of meetings where I can tell you the people I was trying to speak to were on their device. <laughs> were, I mean, it's becoming more and more just in your face, isn't it? It's like there's not even an attempt anymore to hide that we're really like, you know, super multitasking. Um, by contrast, there's great listeners. So kind of shifting, you know, over to, to people in that zone. Any thoughts on if you think of famous, people who are famous for great listening, anybody spring to mind? Terry Gross. Mm -hmm. Oprah. Oprah, like the best. James Lipton. James Lipton, yeah. And for some of you, maybe think of Bill Clinton, the classic, you know, <laughs> staring into, making you feel like the only person in the room. Um, <laughs> so when you think of all those people, they actually have a lot in common. They're using body language a certain way. So they're, they're mindful. These people who are world-class listeners, they're not just accidentally good listeners. They're mindful about what they're doing. So they're leaning towards you. They're making eye contact. They're, they are not doing this, which I'm, I'm really comfortable with my arms crossed. It's, it sends a message that you're not open. So I ha I've had to kind of learn. Don't cross your, your arms if you can help it. Um, and of course, they're not talking when they're listening. That not, not talking part is a funny thing because we have very little education around the not talking part, right? We're taught to perform. We're in a business that's about performing. And so there's all kinds of energy around that. There's not a lot of energy around shutting up. So I put listening kind of at the top of the heap of leadership skills myself, having, having been enlightened far into the game by, by my friend Claire. Um, and I think I put such a high premium on it because there's so much to be gained by being a good listener. Um, it helps you connect with people. Like, this is a, we're talking, you know, soft skills are really the human condition. And good or bad things all come down to how do people really behave? How do they really feel when you're, when you're interacting with them? Um, so a good listener is like, they are drawing people to them. People appreciate being heard. Um, it makes a huge difference to how that audience feels about you. Um, you will be more persuasive when you're a better listener. Um, you could be retaining your best employees by being a good listener and selling your best ideas more often when that client feels they are being heard. 
and you will literally understand better. You will literally understand better what, what is going on. So you'll make higher quality choices. Um, and if you're Bill Clinton, it will <coughs> enhance your career dramatically. When he was <coughs> governor of Arkansas and he wanted to become president, his advisor said, you know, the big missing piece for you is listening. You're a brilliant speaker, but you can, you're a very poor listener. You're, you're kind of not caring about that part. So he, he took that to the nth degree, and, and that's been closely associated with him winning the presidency and, and becoming even to the point of his trademark. Um, so I think great leaders put as much energy and thought into the talking part as the listening part as the talking part. And I want to put you guys through a little, a little experience now uh, because I'd love for you to feel what I'm talking about. It's one thing to hear me go blah, blah, blah about listening. I want you to get what I'm saying. And we had to actually ask a bunch of people to leave the room that really wanted to stay, but there would be no room to do this part if they had. So this is a paired exercise. Um, so the first thing I need to ask is, does everybody have somebody next to them, or is, do we have an odd number of people and somebody has no one? So can you just... <laughs> So you're by yourself, okay. You, so, so can you guys come sit next to each other? Anybody else has no partner? Just raise your hand because we'll solve that. So you two, if you two end up together, um, this is going to be awkward because this is a very tight room, but it's still going to work. It's still going to work. This is the tricky bit. I want you to think of the aisles and this space as usable space because I need you to face each other. So can we just like really quickly, like you need to face, you need to face each other. <laughs> All right, so everyone. So everyone, there's a, there's a quick, everybody's facing someone. Everybody's facing someone. There's a little warm up, one minute warm up. And we're gonna go from that chatter to silence. So for just one minute, Please make eye contact with your partner. Don't break eye contact and don't say anything. Go. No talking. No talking. I feel so sorry for you. I'm not going to make it the full minute. OK. Is your mic on? Yeah. Okay, woo! So, so, si silence, silence, silence. So somebody tell me, I know that sucked, so I don't need to ask about that. Um, did anybody notice, I already know that at least in the beginning it was like just horrible, right? Just so awkward. Did anybody notice a change at all though, from the beginning to the end? So what was that change like? There was a settling moment. And I'm going to build on that and suggest that you were actually, without speaking at all, you were communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. We'd, everybody, nobody's like, that's bullshit. No, we were. <laughs> <laughs> OK. The, so it is really the warm up, but it also there's a wonderful point to be made from <coughs> eye contact. So uh, what's great listening? Eye contact has a ton to do with it. If you're like a lot of people like me, you'd rather not. You'd kind of rather not make that eye contact because it feels awkward, right? Or I feel like people are looking into my soul and I don't like yeah. that. So, but there's much to be gained from it. And I know there's not a lot to be gained from being creepy and staring at somebody for a minute. <laughs> but if you will, you know, run with, you know what? Good listening, eye contact. It is, it, there is communication going on. And the person that is you're acknowledging someone with eye contact. There's a psychology to it. That person feels heard. They feel like you are interested in what they're saying. So it's just that simple and uncomfortable if you're like me and you'd rather not do it. I would say it's something to coach people who work for you on because it really does go a long way towards people feeling you are engaged in what they have to say. So now, the real part. Um, do, do people who want it, some of you are standing, if you want to sit down, that's, there's enough, I know it's cramped. 
but to the degree <coughs> that you can kind of be facing each other. Somebody's A and somebody's yeah. B now. And if you want to sit on the floor, you can. Yeah. You can sit on the floor. So somebody's A, randomly, whoever's closest to this wall is A. How's that? OK, so we've got A and we've got B. Doesn't matter who's who. So A has the easy job. A is going to tell B, for two minutes, you're going to talk about a topic I'm going to give you. A, is got the, a has the hard job because you're the listener. So what I mean is hard about that is your entire 100% job is full focus on who's speaking. And that is easy, harder than it sounds. Because what you'll suddenly realize in this mindful exercise is <coughs> you have thoughts trying to compete for what they're saying nonstop. You're going to be thinking about their hair color. You're going to be thinking about lunch. You're going to be thinking about what's next. You're going to be thinking about Cindy Gallup, who's talking later, whatever you're going to think about. And you have to really be, I want you to please be very aware of I'm doing that thing and shove it away to stay fully focused on what that person's saying. The ground rules are you cannot say anything. Only, this, only A is speaking. You can acknowledge any way you want with body language. Be natural, be yourself. There's no quiz later. You don't have to memorize what they're saying. So don't worry about that. And A, don't worry about, I'd better be interesting. No, just be yourself. <laughs> just be yourself. There's no performance <laughs> here. So we got that straight. Um, so I'm, it's only two minutes. Um, some of you might even be done saying what you have to say before that. If so, just expand on what you're saying so that it doesn't turn into silence. And, uh, and I'll call time. So A, here's what I would invite you to talk to B about. Tell them, what's the hardest thing you've ever had to do? And that could be a work thing, a not work thing. If the hardest thing you had to do is something you do not want to share, do not share it. Pick something else. <laughs> that was hard. I do not want anybody leaving here traumatized. So. Um, so my next question is, does, can everybody think of something? All right, good. Can you have an alternate, an alternate prompt? <laughs> um, can you? Just one hard thing can just be one hard thing that we have to do? Oh, it's, it's just, yes, absolutely. It can just be something hard. So if it's not the hardest thing, just something that was hard. <laughs> if you've had a baby, you're already covered. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just for two minutes. Got it? A's go speaker. ahead and, pardon? He's the speaker. <laughs> A is the speaker. Or you can switch. Make your partner A if she has something. So A, tell B. Go. It's OK if you didn't get totally through your story. It, it, it'll all make sense soon. Now, for just a minute, however far you did get into that storytelling, did most people basically ex get through their story or, yeah? Good. For just a minute, please B, tell A, something you learned about them from that. Not what they said, not just, oh, I heard you said you did this. And that. No, what did you learn about that human being when they told you that story? So just for a minute, talk about that. <laughs> okay, guys. All right. So can anybody guess what happens next? So B, so B, I'll give you just a, just a moment to think about something that's been really hard for you to do, to tell A about. Same thing now. A, it's your turn for the really, really hard job. <coughs> Pushing away all those thoughts that are trying to bust in. Resisting the urge to jump in and speak. A already knows how, or B already knows how hard that is. Um, okay, so just two minutes. Everybody got their sort of a topic they can talk about? All right, go. All right, and you already know exactly what's next, too. Is now the listener's going to tell the speaker What's something you learned about them from what you just heard for two minutes? Just for a minute. Go. Yeah, so that was different. Um, 
putting on the, now you've played both parts, thinking about when you were listening. What was, does anybody, obviously a very exaggerated experience and the lesson is not supposed to be, so just never say anything again uh, for, for three minutes and be all silent and stuff. But it, it exaggerated for a reason, for you to kind of maybe have some new thoughts and new, new things occur to you around listening. Anybody want to say anything about what that, what was different about that listening experience? I thought it was easier than I would have imagined to show that you're listening, just non-verbal. Like, I'd probably do that anyway. Like <coughs> but I didn't think, I'd never thought about that. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I bet she says I'm listening because I feel like I'm listening. Right. And I felt like non-verbally I was showing that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I was A first and then B second. So um, in this experience, I it was hard for me to not prepare my response so that I knew what my task was <laughs> already. <laughs> And was it, does ev did everyone find it pretty challenging to, when you really thought about it, when you were asked to really be aware of it, it was kind of, there was pretty much effort there, wasn't there, to really totally listen, yeah. I didn't find it as hard to listen as it was to not respond verbally. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. like, mm -hmm. she was saying things, I was like, I totally know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, but how much more quickly she was able to sort of develop her idea when I shut up. Right, so, so, so many of us can't wait to, in a, in a way that we intend to be very positive, we can't wait to jump in and add, right, to what's being said. And if you think about it, they're not going to then tell you what they were going to tell you. And maybe that's too bad. And so the thought of making more space for people to go ahead and say everything they were going to say, you might have a big win from that. Like, I, yeah. Seriously. And I really felt like she does not want me to talk about this. Like there was no verbal encouragement, no not empathy kind of it was very off putting. Yeah. It's a little awkward on the talking for two minute side because you're like, is this interesting? Like I told you not to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm betting you were interesting. That's what I'm betting. Okay, one one more, but since we're so time pressed, I'm sorry. What what did you want to share about that? Well, I, I was going to say this, the same thing, actually. It was just that I think that it's a cultural thing mm -hmm. that you, um, if you talk and interject and stuff like that, like well, I'm from the South, and I started meeting somebody, my fiance is French, and he's like silent when you talk, and I was mm -hmm. like, is he still paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> but like his family doesn't interject, and that's how they show that they Right. And then in terms of interjecting, what I found to be really challenging, especially as like a, a creative director and working with clients where my job is to lead them to the most useful information mm -hmm. when they often don't know that. I do that, I spread that into my entire life. And so when I'm talking to somebody, I'll often ask leading questions like, oh, so that's really interesting. I hear you saying this. Tell me more about what you did then. And I still though agree that sometimes having that space is nice Mm -hmm. conversation going to. So I have a question for you. If you'd had a black card between you and the speaker, would it have been any different? Yeah. So I would have thought it'd be harder because you don't have that affirmation or the. Well, it'd be easier not to respond. That's what I'm saying. Be easier not to respond. Right. Right. Uh, bring to mind anything that's a regular occurrence. <laughs> so over half of listening is visual. Like way over half of listening is visual. So this is something to be mindful of. We are paying a giant price when we do meetings on the phone. So, so there's this false sense of economy. Oh, I saved time. I saved money. I did it on the phone. No, you just made it into three meetings. You hurt relationships because so much disrespectful. Have you ever noticed that? People are less respectful on the phone. Um, misunderstanding, broken telephone on and on and on. So this is one of the things I want to highly recommend you go back and really do everything you can to, to see change. Absolutely false sense of economy. If you just had it in person in the first place, you could be building relationships. You could be having, using good listening behaviors that are going to mean you have a more receptive audience to, that may be much more likely to buy what you're selling. Um, I'm going to leave you with two Two suggestions. Um, 
Next time you do have to do a phone, because I know I can't wave a wand and they're all gone. The next time you have to, try replicating in-person behaviors, if you think of it that way. Um, appoint somebody to point out if somebody's not tracking with what's being said. Like, you know what, I see Joe is confused. Could you repeat that? That sort of thing. Ask up front, can we all agree to put down our weapons, <laughs> our handheld devices, in other words? We are really blowing it over. I can't even tell you how, how deadly that is, that we're multitasking while we're on the phone. We know the clients do it. We do it. It has become accepted somehow, bizarrely, totally acceptable. But that doesn't mean we're not paying a price. We're paying a really, really big price. Um, and always, <laughs> at the end of the meeting, if somebody else didn't do it, confirm what did, now here's what we heard. How many meetings have you left where everybody says, oh, I think we're doing this next, but nobody confirmed, and you're wrong. So that's one of those things. It happens in real life, in FaceTime, too. It's one of those things that it, it just could save everyone from so much grief. So different kinds of phone meetings. Try for video calls if you can't do the um, FaceTime. <coughs> Invest more in getting there. You'll save money in the end, and you'll have so much to show for it. The other thought that's kind of weird, but I've seen this happen now so many times when people have tried this. Think of the next high pressure meeting you have as maybe doing it in two parts. <coughs> Part one, you make your presentation of whatever it is, and it's understood that you are just going to end the meeting after you have listened intently to what the clients said, or whoever, whoever your audience is. And they understand this is the end of the meeting. We are not. What, what shocks them senseless is the idea that you mean I'm not going to have that great big arm wrestle at the end of you know, <laughs> what I say? You make them feel heard, and you are going to have a very different outcome. So they're going to be thrilled if you say, we want to really focus 100% on what you, your thoughts are after we share our thinking. Um, one caveat, can we start with what worked? Have you ever noticed that clients start with what doesn't work so often. They're trained to do that. You know, most of them are trained to start with what doesn't work. You will hear them better if they start with what worked. And they can, just as that what doesn't work can be a downward spiral, what does work can be an upward spiral. Mm -hmm. Then part two, after lunch, the next morning, whenever it is, then it's understood, let's have really good dialogue around what happened. So, the difference between you giving your, your reaction to the feedback then as opposed to in the moment is it's no longer the heat of the moment. You're not doing unfortunate, foolish choices of words and whatnot and not thinking through things before you speak. <laughs> if you're anything like me, that's something I did regularly. Um, so you're going to have a much higher quality discussion. And you'll have had that chance as a team to talk about what's our best, what's our best angle here. So when I say listen better, I don't mean do what they say, by the way do whatever they say. That's not what I mean by good listening. I just mean literally understand better. And, and you, will, um, you will see, I think, what many of the people that go through our training, leadership training program have seen, which is way, way better relationships and the great results to show for it. Yes? <coughs> I'll give you one question, just because we're so, we started so late on this, we're trying so hard not to leave behind the other two great shifts. Okay. I'll um, give you the one question. Thank you. Uh, so I was curious about when I'm in a work environment, and whether it's a client presentation or an internal presentation, I notice that we are all not very good listeners, but oftentimes everyone's like, like they, they just want to clobber each other. And oftentimes that makes me kind of just take a step back and let everybody kind of air their thoughts. <coughs> but how do you make that a better environment? Like, is it important to say, hey, we're not listening effectively here. We need to speak one at a time. I'm not exactly sure what the protocol is. If it's just me and my agency, situation, it's fine, but how do you bring that into the larger picture? Because it seems like leading by example is hard to do because it's so subtle. And, and people will just keep talking as long as there's quiet space. 
Um, I don't think there's a simple answer to your question, but I'll, I, by way of example, I can tell you that I've seen in people trying to go ahead and run with what I just suggested, that two-part thing, mm -hmm. where the leader has said to the team, follow my lead. <laughs> Let, if I'm making lots of space for people to talk, you know, I don't want to hear you jump in. Like, mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're truly going to hold back. And it's just as simple as tell everybody, you know what? This is what this we're going to try. This it's a it's a better way to connect with our clients and to understand what they have to say. And then there can be if the clients if there's the dilemma of they're just the worst. I mean I do think that the creative leader has the opportunity to have the one-on-one -on -one over lunch or something to talk about. I think this could go better. Like do you, could we try this new strat? Could we try a different strategy that gets right at what the benefit, you know, taking all the benefits of good listening into the room. So I do think it's not a matter of just hoping it'll be better. I think you have to actually have an active discussion around what could work better. So hopefully we'll have time to talk more about all these topics before you go off to your delayed lunch. Um, but we're going to switch gears now over to our second shift in mindsets and behaviors. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm going to... Um, bring Elaine into the discussion. She's going to talk about um, shifting from a model of lone wolf, that hero approach, I want to be the hero and, and solve the problem myself, to um, being a leader that can um, successfully um, create a more collaborative environment and um, do the magic trick of getting people to buy into that. I know in my experience, uh, as a creative person, as an art director, I know I wasn't really big on collaboration for a very long time. So what would you say, first of all, is the benefit of adopting a more collaborative working style well, as a leader? Well, you know, I think that's a really um, you know, <coughs> interesting question because I have worked in agencies as a producer and working in a creative department, and it's a completely collaborative effort every day. But now on my own business, you know, I am sort of a lone wolf and I've had to certainly train myself to open myself up to being more collaborative and choosing ways to work with other people so I'm not in my head all the time. Um, I'm a huge fan of collaboration. I think um, it's become a huge part of my business whether I'm working with creative groups or small business owners. Um, people are really, they just really want to figure out how to do this more effectively. Um, and as probably all of you have seen, I mean, it's been a topic we've been talking about, uh, you know, since yesterday on some level or another. I think that, um, you know, when we're, the, the thing about it is that when we think about what's going on with collaboration right now, it's a very hot topic. I, I say just Google it because there's, you know, articles, blog posts, you know, videos, how to be collaborative. I'm sure there's some ones that are, you know, more on the, uh, the ironic side or the funny side, too. But um, I really believe that the, the strongest parts about collaboration is that it's going to build stronger outcomes with, and also build stronger teams. Um, and I think the third thing is, is it's going to make you... Uh, a stronger and a new kind of leader because you're looking at things not just from your own your own space but from that of an effective leader within your team and it's going to support you in your career um, you know Nancy was actually telling me a great example of how she had gone through a, a, a project and um, I think you really benefited from a, a very collaborative uh, experience um, I, would you like to share that? Because I feel like that was really helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll just give the broad strokes. Um, I think I have a, of course, we were chatting about this topic a lot, the three of us. And, and my favorite collaboration win story is around a um, uh, campaign that was done for a, a cereal in Canada called Shreddies. And <coughs> has that anybody remember Diamond Shreddies? Some of you, some of you have. Um, it was this ridiculous campaign that was a f introducing a fake line extension for a square wheat cereal in Canada. And the whole concept was that 
it's not Shreddy's, it's not Shreddy's, it's Diamond Shreddy's. And this whole <laughs> big campaign went out around, <laughs> it's way better. And it was the idea of the summer intern. And he came to me um, with this scribble and he had drawn up the box, Diamond Shreddy's, and he'd drawn the square, old, boring, the diamond, new, exciting. <laughs> 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 and, and from there, this actually, became, this was the Grand Clio winner for Best Integrated Campaign of 2008. Mm -hmm. So now that intern did not know how to take that scribble and make a Grand Clio <laughs> Best, integrated, Best Integrated Campaign. So um, I was in the position to decide at that moment, how are we going to bring this forward? And, and I decided to engage um, a very diverse group around this guy, uh, which included ve two very senior ACDs. And their marching or orders were to link arms with the intern and run with it. And it was um, also pulled in um, many, other, many other team members, including people that had nothing to do with the brand, including um, a comedian at one mm -hmm. point that was the intern's improv coach. <laughs> and he turned into, if anybody saw the, the videos to that, we did real research with this improv guy who totally pulled off being the researcher. And real people talked about they did think the diamonds were better. <laughs> so <laughs> talk to me later about what's wrong with research. So. Um, <laughs> So that was, that was just so awesome and it, was, it meant very senior people having to suck it up and it wasn't their idea. They did not like being asked to help, mm -hmm. but they got over it and, they, and everybody had a great time and everybody had their name on that Grand Clio. It wasn't just the summer intern, right? So everybody won. So it was a big, it was a win for all. It was a big win. But that leads me to my next question, which mm -hmm. is around... Um, well, what's, what's tough about collaboration? There can be a lot of resistance to doing it. So, so what have you observed about that, and what do you do about that resistance? Well, I think that's what I would ask the person that's resisting. Um, <laughs> that would be one of my first questions to someone is, why are you resisting uh, collaborating with other people? But I, I have to say that when you think about it, it's because it's been successful. You know, when you work alone and you come up with ideas and it just works for you, you know. Um, I find that, you know, another reason why people are resistant is that they've had some not so great experiencing working with other people. And um, a forced sense of collaboration can kind of put you at odds. Here I am with these people that I'm not really clear how we connect and we have to get this thing done. So. I think that it makes sense that, you know, patterns will emerge and you will start to just stay in your comfort zone and not really want to step outside of that. Um, and also think about it, you know, when you're going to meetings all the time and collaborating all day long, you know, I mean, has anybody gotten back to their desk at like six o'clock in the evening and then started their day? Right? So you're like, okay, no, I won't be home because I have to, um, yeah, I'm starting from scratch. I'm having breakfast now. You know, so it's really, you know, it is, it, it can be a difficult thing to make that shift. Um, I, I, and, you know, I'm not really here to just say that working alone is out, you know, and collaboration is in, you know, like, bing. Um, but I would say, that, you know, it really is important in the creative process to be able to have both. You know, to have that time with other people, to build on ideas, but also be able to have that time to get the space to think creatively about what you're trying to accomplish. So, um, you know, both are important. And I think it's, in, it's an important thing for a creative director to observe, or anyone really that's in a leadership position, to just kind of observe how your team works and find out something that can be, um, you know, that can really work for your team. There is no formula to it, but you really have to be, you know, you really have to be involved and present and understand, you know, who's in the room and how do we make this work. Um, so, um, so I think that, you know, if you're wondering, well then how do I remove resistance from 
you know, certain people that I, you're probably sitting in the audience and identifying them now, <laughs> you know, that are completely resistant to being with others and they don't play nice with others. I think the first part is to remind them about the benefits of, of what collaboration can do, but also point out past successes where you have been highly collaborative and you have done something great, kind of like Nancy's win. You know, having that opportunity to say, you know, we did a great job together. And maybe that was an early on experience where it was a little kicking and screaming. But I think that once people start to see, and I do believe that now people are much more open to collaboration, i.e. Google it, everybody wants to do it better. Um, I think that's an important part of the puzzle. But there's, you've got some specific tips around how, you do, how do you really make that work? Yeah, and I think it's important to, um, you know, first, again, we're talking about getting to know your team. I mean, not just the work, because that's sort of a hard skill. Like, you're, you, you, you see what the work looks like every day. But it's more about, you know, seeing, you know, what they care about. Like, what's their investment in the work? Why are they doing the work? What gets them excited about the work? And, um, you know, asking questions about what they value. I think, you know, how are you going to know? You don't make the assumption that you understand everybody on your team. In addition to the fact that you're working with a lot of other people in the agency that are attached to projects. So it's really important to make sure that everybody's on the same page or you at least get what's going on with them. Um, I think that um, you know it's also it's also important to make t to create time, create space to connect with your team, whether it's a Skype call um, or if it's coffee or if you know if it's just stopping in to check to check in. And you know, let's face it, as as you grow in management, it gets harder to stop by and have a chat, but um, but it is important to be consistent about doing that. So. One of the things, and I'll give you this one example. Uh, my friend Rachel Hauksieger, who is the creative director at TJ Maxx in um, Framingham in Boston, she um, runs the e-commerce division there. And what she does is she creates weekly walking meetings where she sets a half an hour in her calendar once a week, and she and her team have an agenda pre pre-written up, and they go and they walk and they talk about the things that they're trying to do and accomplish. And she said, I get more done in that walking uh, collaborative moment than I do in a 90-minute, you know, conference room talk. So, you know, just, you, you're creative, you know, try to think of some other creative ways based on your situation that can work. Um, so that's number one, get to know your team. Number two, really important to communicate out, you know. Um, I think that you, as a leader, set the tone for the group. So I think yeah, it's really important to understand what you want and what you want from your team and sort of understanding your own ex expectations. Um, and sometimes they can be, you know, it's hard to, hard to get proportion around that. But really understand your expectations. And I think then model that for your team. And so. It, you know, if you value people being on time, then be on time. You know, if you value people being open to guidance, then you be open to guidance or, or, or suggestion. You know, and, and, the, and then another thing is if you um, want to be respected for your position and your ideas, you know, I think that the important thing is for you to also allow people to share their ideas with you because they're going to be more invested in that experience with you. And they'll feel like they have, that they're actually um, being able to, uh, and in addition, they'll be able to create more um, with that investment. They'll be, feel like they can opt in to be part of what, what the team's trying to do. Um, I think the important thing is to be consistent. And you know, I'm dying to ask this question, but I don't think I have time. And maybe I'll ask you again later. But you know, I would love to hear from some of you about how you try to stay um, connected in your communication, how you try to st keep that consistency throughout process. Because, you know, you can't just say it once to someone. 
You have to say it more than once. Anyway, I know I'm running out of time, and we could really do a spa weekend on any of these <laughs> topics. So um, the other thing that I will say is, as a coach, I would say, please just build on what you know, because you know more than you think you do. Um, and in advertise, advertising life, you're collaborating every day. <laughs> you may not feel like you are, <laughs> but you are. And I, you know, I think that it's important whether you're, uh, you know, another part of the, the um, being a creative director, you're also now collaborating with senior management. So that creates another level of collaboration within your organization, not just your team, not just other pe personnel in the, in the company, and not the client. And that's another conversation, right? So little quick tap in, tap into your past partnerships. What did those look like? You know, there was a getting to know you period, right? There was a work style, uh, you know, um, trying to figure out work style. There's also, um, you know, presenting together who was going to lead, who was going to pick up, you know, on the end. And so, think, you know, just think about what works. Like Nancy C said earlier, I'm a big fan also of building on what's going well. And then you're going to have so much more room to make more things happen. So, in closing, um, I would say that the important thing is uh, to trust yourself, okay? Because I'm pulling out my card here, but, you know, trust yourself. I really don't have to look that far to say that, you know, you've been hired for a reason for the position you're in. And again, you know a lot of things, and people trust you to be in that position. So, you know, don't doubt yourself. Like, really try to work through that because, this is about your career too, and this is a time in li your life that you're building on new formed knowledge and things that are important to you. So that's my conclusion on that. And now we'll move <laughs> over from the, the shift from me, me, me to mentoring. Hi guys, that's me. Um, hopefully none of you are dying to go to the bathroom right now. I know we're running over, but um, yeah, I mean obviously You've, pro you've heard this in several other sessions. Um, our business is really one of relationships. Uh, they, they make or break everything you do. They're the reason a client will hire you. They're a reason a client will leave. They're a reason good people will leave your agency. It's why, you know, if there's that one art director who's super stellar and he takes off, you're worried, like, oh, he's going to take his awesome copywriter with him. You know, there's that. It, we're connected. So we're, we're all mindful of that as, as connectors and as people who work in, that in, in this industry. Um, but one of the things, because we're also a very competitive industry, is that we spend a lot of our time focused up on the people that we're building relationships with up. Like, oh yeah, I want to make sure that one senior brand guy knows that that was my idea. Or I want to get FaceTime with the creative director so she knows I'm ready for the next promotion. Or you, know, you want to make sure that you're, making these, you're aligning with the right people, with all the po political <laughs> stuff. And so, there's a lot of that focus, and I think we're, we're taught that early on when we start out in the business. You're always looking at the next level and trying to, trying to get time with them, trying to get them to appreciate you, trying to get them to recognize that you are talented, that you're a go-getter. Um, and that's kind of how we, how we get the next job. That's kind of how we, how we maneuver our way in this industry. Um, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret, and this is something that I feel like I'm focused very much on right now because I'm uh, an ACD. But I feel like sometimes um, a lot of my creative director friends have found that they kind of skip over this and then they get into a creative director role where this is a, this, they're now having to like step back and remember this. But um, building relationships down is just as important as the relationships that you build up. Um, because when you're investing in somebody that's more junior than you, you're actually really investing in your own career. So how does working with juniors, you know, help you with your career? Ah, juniors. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have great, great um, stories. I have plenty, including a young gentleman who I had to explain to him why he had to uh, keep his clothes on. Um, <laughs> true story. You can talk, you can ask me about it later. Um, but juniors, I mean, juniors are a lot of work, yes, but they're also, they're also the energy. If you're ever getting sack, sacked out of time and you feel run down, go talk to a junior. They're so excited to be working, and they're so excited to have your time. And I think they're, they're, a, tap in, they're a direct line into 
what's cool and happening right now. I mean, I, I'm teaching a class. I have no idea what Snapchat is. I don't know if any of you guys can figure out that interface, but I certainly can't. I don't. I have no idea, but they're all over it. So you know, they're the ones that actually have a, the pulse on what's going on, and we're the one. We're, we've kind of moved a little bit further than that. So keeping in touch with them is a great way to t stay in touch with reality. Um, it's a great way to stay humble and remember what you don't know, because. Being humble and, and having that sense of like not knowing everything will really make everyone like you a lot better, um, makes you much more approachable. Um, and the other thing is that it keeps you on your, on your toes, honestly. You never know what you're going to get from them. Um, I mean, how many of you guys this week, week even, or last week, were in a meeting or were in a kickoff meeting and had the thought, like they said the thing, like, oh, we're, it's, it's a responsive site for them. And you're like, boom, got it. I know what I'm doing, been there, done that. We've just done one like that. I know exactly how I'm going to go on this. I mean, anybody like have that feeling when you, you're already, yeah, you already know. You're like, I've done one just like this two weeks ago or whatever. You were just working on a project like that. Of course. I mean, we're, we're senior creatives. So after you've logged enough industri industry hours, you, you do start to get that mindset of like, oh, I know what I'm doing. And you, you have your like, quick way to get there. But um, the thing that's so great about working with juniors is they kind of take you out of that autopilot mode because they don't have the same context that you do. And sometimes I find, personally, that having to take a step back and really start explaining from the ground up will cause me to question my process, find holes in my process, and even um, allow me to tap into better ideas or better concepts or even a smarter way of doing it. Um, and that's something that you just don't get when you're working with everybody who's on auto autopilot and is like totally on it. I know I, I'm ready to go. Um, so that's that's some awesome things about working with juniors. So what if you don't have any juniors to work with? And this is probably not for most of you guys in here, but I know that there's a few people who are working into ACD or around there. Um, a lot of agencies, at least in San Francisco, run pretty lean. So you might not have a lot of juniors to spend time with. So I would just say, go rent some for the day. And this is even if you're a very senior person and you're like removed from the juniors in your office and maybe you don't want to like step on your ACD toes or whatever, go pop into a school. Ask them if you can do a portfolio review. Um, you know, there's so many, so many portfolio schools going around. There's lots of ways that you can do that. Um, another great thing to do is speed mentoring. Some of you guys probably did that this year. If you haven't, sign up for that next year. Come back to 3%, do that. That's a great opportunity to get to know a lot of people who are working their way up um, and to give you six minutes to talk to them. It's not a huge time commitment. And another thing is pop on the LinkedIn. Like there's so many people that have post questions in the advertising groups about like, hey, I really want to become a copywriter. How do I do this? Or there'll be students that have their portfolios on there and they're asking for feedback. Give them some feedback. I mean, and that can just take 10 minutes time. But one, one thing that I really find is when you're doing that, you're really getting into that leader, leadership mindset because you're having to take a point of view on something that they're doing. Um, and sometimes it's not something that you're, maybe you're a digital person and you've been working on, you've been working on these large e-commerce sites for the entire time. And you get a student who has a, an integrated campaign that needs work. I mean, that's a great way to get those chops working again. So I would just say, you know, be resourceful. If you have a friend that has an internship program, pop in and talk to them, do a guest lecture. There's so many ways to get involved and get that good energy um, into your life. So. I think we've talked about this, and in your experience, you know, how do you start thinking like a creative director? You know, how do you do that if you've never done it before? So this is kind of going to defeat the purpose of CD Boot Camp because <laughs> our whole thing that we're saying here is you need training. And um, I'm actually going to say that you've been in training since you started in the industry. And you're going to say, okay, uh, maybe. But from that very first moment that you stepped into your first agency role, you're logging your experiences with people. And I'm willing to bet that you guys have all had creative directors that you didn't have positive experiences with, or that you didn't like the way they gave feedback. And I'm willing to bet that a lot of you, hopefully, a lot of you, all of you, have had great experiences with managers who were really good about um, checking in with you, making sure you were working towards your goals, uh, making sure that you felt good about the work you were presenting. Um, 
those are all things to tap into because we all have very strong feelings about, we know how we feel about working with certain people. There's like an, it, there's a, a, an emotional thing right away. You either, oh, she made me feel so good or oh my God, I can't, I'm gonna have to deal with that guy again, you know, or her again. Um, Tap into that, like that, that's a great guide. And even if you're ever in an experience where you've never been in there before, um, I, would, I would challenge you to look back, like take a walk down memory lane and try to put yourself in the shoes of when you were in that position and your younger self and, um, and how you felt. And then I would just, I would just uh, tell you that, you know, find, if, if you were in that experience and didn't like the way that it went, do something different. And if you were in an experience and you liked the way it went, great. Use that as a guide. I mean, you, you, guys, you guys have the experience to pull from. Whether or not you've actually been in a leadership role, you've worked with leaders, you know what works for you. Right. And use that as a guide. So Laurel, you know, you gave some really good suggestions, I think, for ev everyone. So when people say, okay, mentoring, that sounds like a great idea, but doesn't it mean a long time commitment? And this is the thing too, and we've talked a lot about mentorship, so I think it's like a hot topic here. Um, and yeah, I know we're all really busy. We have a million things going on. We have kids, families, and jobs that require us to work a lot, a lot of hours. Um, and so it, you do think like, oh man, I don't have another second to give. But I would challenge you that mentoring doesn't necessarily have to be a huge time commitment. I, I teach, and yes, that is mentoring on steroids, and that is a large time commitment. So definitely don't do that if you're already at your peak. But um, you can actually be a mentor in five minutes. You can be a mentor in two emails a month. And I would challenge you in that case to make yourself available, but actually let the mentee know what you're capable of giving them. You can even put a framework around it like, hey, all right, I really wanna help you out. Let's, set a t let's, um, let's email on the 1st and 15th of every month, or let's set up a Skype call once every, or s drop into my meeting, we can have a one-on-one -on -one once a month. Or whatever that time frame looks like, what you feel like you can give, that's okay. Just frame that out for them, and they will be so grateful to have whatever you're willing to give. And I think that that also, in that, if you feel like, I'm not sure what I can help with, it's okay to say, like, hey, you know, here are the topics that I, that I think I could help you out with. Or, um, when in doubt, I feel like there are four things that are really awesome and really helpful. Um, the first one is your experience. Um, you're all unique. You've all had your own unique creative, creative experiences, your own unique uh, leadership experience, and your own unique path. So just sharing of yourself, like that's something that only you can give that person. Only you can have that unique perspective. So that's valuable in itself. Um, the second thing would be lessons learned. Man, I have some learned some lessons hard <laughs> in this business, and I'm sure all of you guys have too. And I think that thinking about how awkward that was to go through that, if I can spare anybody else that pain, I would be so glad to. So I'm always happy to share with people my awkwardness and the things that I did wrong and why they don't want to do them <laughs> the same way that I did. Um, the third thing, I'm like, I'm gonna forget this, but the third thing is, um, oh, yes, uh, your honest feedback. In stepping into this kind of a relationship with someone, you're already setting up um, a kind of a safe space because you're already letting them know you're interested in them, you care about them. So if they need to hear something, make it kind and let it be from you that they're hearing this because if you're not gonna tell them that they need to work on their uh, they need to work on their presentation skills or maybe they're coming across a little this or that. Um, they're gonna hear it from somebody else and I think it would be a lot better coming from you. So if you have feedback, get them used to getting feedback and be thoughtful and kind about the way that you give it. And the fourth thing is when in doubt, just listen. Just give them your ears because a lot of, we talked about this, that, that just it's so nice to just be heard. Sometimes maybe you don't have the answer um, and sometimes people just need to talk, like they just need to be heard. It's, it can be a lonely thing to be starting out in this industry, so just lend your ears. You don't necessarily have to have all the answers for them, but those would be the four things that I would say you can offer as a mentor. So I have one last question. Can I get it in? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Uh, well, you know, it seems, like, yeah, it seems like being a mentor has really helped lay the foundation <laughs> for management. Can you elaborate just a little bit further? So this is kind of cheesy, but I really do feel like mentorship 
is um, the soul of management. And what I mean by that is when you're a mentor, there's no glamorous title, there's no big paycheck. People aren't like, oh, you're the mentor. You know, it's just, it's not fancy. You're, but, but it's yes. not, it's not fancy. There's not a lot of glory there. It's not the same as having a fancy creative director title. Um, but what it does have is it has that you just, out of the goodness of your heart, or whatever else it is, you decided to care about somebody else and take a vested interest in their career and their progression. And that comes from a very good place, like a, a place of caring about people and wanting to bring out good for them. And I would just say that as you move from management into management and higher levels of management, if you can keep that that genuine care for the people that are working for you, it will really help you stay in touch with your humanity, which will make you a leader that people actually want to follow. Um, so I know it's tough, but just remember that your people are people, and uh, they want to be reminded of that too. So. And I'm going to um, add to that by saying I would do it for entirely selfish reasons. Um, I have always had a huge interest in mentoring since I was a, an art director with no title beyond art director, and it absolutely made my career. Um, and I, I really built it. I worked at an agency with very small budgets, and the fact that I was interested in helping the youngest meant that we could have a department with enough people in it that happened to be quite junior. And by putting a lot of energy into that uh, mentoring, they progressed much faster, much faster than, than would regularly be expected. And, and ultimately, that story that I told you, that intern landed on the cover of, of Canada's Time magazine. <laughs> like, that's nuts. But that's, it's possible. It's possible. I think we're on time. And I think we're not going to hold you after time. So even with a 15 minutes gutted from our presentation, <laughs> yeah. you guys need to eat something. So thank you so much for coming. We can talk. Anybody who wants to talk, we can all talk to us. Come on up. We're, we'll stay here.